Well, good evening, everyone. It's a joy to see you in the Lord's house this Wednesday evening. Also, those of you joining us on uh, Facebook Live, we're glad to have you as well. But uh, the Lord's blessed us with a sunny, warm, beautiful day. And he's allowed us this time to come into his house and to uh, look into his word and spend a few moments in prayer. And so we're grateful to the Lord for that blessing tonight. Uh, you're a blessing, and I'm thankful that you're taking time uh, to worship him tonight and to uh, take heed to his word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, as stated, we are thankful for this day. We are thankful, Lord, for the many blessings that you do bestow upon us each and every day of our lives. We, as we assemble tonight, Lord, we are mindful that there are those within our congregation that are sick, that have lost loved ones, that are hurting, that have uh, many different concerns, Lord, in their lives. And Lord, we ask for your grace and mercy to be multiplied upon their homes tonight. We pray for healing. We pray for strength. We pray for encouragement and comfort. God, help us as we look into your word to, uh, that you would help us to open our spiritual eyes and that we would see your truths that you have delivered to us in your word and that you would grow our faith through them. Lord, make it beneficial. And Lord, go before us in this service and receive not only our prayers, but also our praise and song. And we thank you, Lord, for the wonderful story that we do have to tell, the story of your love, the story of our Savior, Jesus Christ, coming to earth to redeem us from our sins at the cross of Calvary. We ask these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ. And all of his children said tonight, Amen. 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 Well, turn with me, if you will, to hymn number 626. We'll sing all three stanzas of I Love to Tell the Story, 626. Oh 
tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Amen. You may be seated. I hope that you're making plans to be with us this Sunday morning, Sunday school at 10 o'clock. We have a class for everyone. Come on out to Sunday school, get involved, and then also uh, we'll be observing the ordinance of the Lord's Supper Sunday morning. So that's always an exciting time in the life of a Christian and in the life of a local congregation. Sunday night, we're continuing in this new series in the Fellowship Hall, uh, marked by Christ. And then next Sunday morning, Going along with your Sunday school lesson, we'll be starting a new Sunday, Sunday morning series for six weeks called Living for the Lord, Living for God. So be praying for uh, your services and be involved in all that is going on that you also may benefit and grow from what's going on here at the church. Well, turn with me, if you will, back to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. We've been in here for a few weeks looking at these different psalms within the psalm of 119, as some has called it, the golden alphabet. And tonight we'll be looking at verses 65 through 72, 65 through 72. Now we've already discussed how adversity and persecution is the backdrop of Psalm 119. In other words, what we're saying is, is that the psalmist was experiencing uh, much adversity and even persecution for his faith in the Lord. We understand tonight uh, that adversity can be hard, but can we make good use of adversity in our lives? Well, yes, absolutely we can. Because adversity has a way of throwing us into the arms of the Lord, doesn't it? Uh, we can use adversity to grow in our relationship with God and to grow in our understanding of spiritual life when we lean into the chest of the Lord and not allow our heart to grow cold, hard, or bitter. When adversity comes into our life, there's a choice. And it's more than a one-time choice, but it is a series of choices that we make. Will I allow this adversity, this difficulty, this challenge to draw me away from closeness with the Lord, or will I allow it to bring me closer unto the Lord? And so the psalmist rejoices in the faithfulness of God in the midst of his adversity, and he used adversity to grow. And there we have, and thus we have this beautiful psalm. He trusted the Lord, and he did not lean upon his own understanding. And so that being said, let's read these eight verses of 65 through 72 of Psalm 119. And the Bible says, You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. Their heart is unfeeding. Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I was afflicted. Now that's a grown-up Christian thing to say, isn't it? Yeah, that's not always easy to say, but it's important at times. It is good for me that I was afflicted. Why? That I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. And so let's go back to verse 65. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Now here the psalmist is reflecting on God's faithfulness uh, throughout his whole life, and especially during this time of, of adversity that he was experiencing. Yes, there have been challenges that not only he saw, but we all see. There are difficulties, and yes, at times, even persecution for our faith in different ways. But he says that God had dealt well with him, and he could not be silent about it, but he praised the Lord. As he looked over his life, he sees that the Lord overall had treated him well, even in his adversity. Uh, I, th I thought uh, this last week of putting this together of the financial guru, Dave Ramsey, 
of a saying that he says, and that has also been echoed by many others when they ask, how are you doing? He says, better than I deserve. And so it is true. We are better than we deserve as Christians. God has been good. God does all things well. But to God, he, he's simply being faithful to his word. That's simply it. God cannot do anything but do all things well. Uh, he has promised to be faithful to those who he has entered into a covenant relationship with, and God is not able to go back on what he has spoken or what he has promised. So he's being faithful according to his word. He's doing, dealing well with his servant according to his word. And so we too should say that God has dealt well with us. We all have experienced adversity, challenge, illness, difficulty, maybe even persecution to some degree. But overall, as we look in our life, we have to say that God has dealt well with his servants. Amen? Even in hardship, we have been treated better than we deserve from God. It is not by chance that God has dealt well with his children because, again, he's promised to do so. And so praise is becoming of his children. We should praise him because he has dealt well with us. We too, especially in hardship, uh, should with faith choose to praise the Lord in all circumstances, believing that God has dealt well with us, even in adversity, even in hardships. God is a good master, amen? And he's been faithful to us through his word. Psalm 119, verse 9, he says this, Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. His faithfulness towards his people never runs out, does it? Isn't that glorious? And so let's look at verse 66. He says, teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Now, if you don't believe in God's word, you won't be concerned about whether you are taught of God's word or not. But when you believe that God's word is God's word, there will be a desire for God to teach you the judgments and the knowledge that we find in his word through the Holy Spirit. Good judgment and heavenly knowledge do not come to us t totally naturally. There are some people who have good common sense, but this is something different than even common sense. We need the Lord to teach us through his word and the Holy Spirit working through his word for us to understand God's judgments. However, we will not learn without faith. And so faith must be applied. We must believe in the Lord's word. We must take it for what it claims to be God's revelation to us. And if we are to learn from the Lord, we must first believe in his wisdom and in his divine knowledge. We must believe that he has a wisdom and a knowledge that we need if we're going to believe and ask him to guide us through that good judgment and good knowledge. The psalmist makes himself a student, if you will, and he asks the Lord to teach him. And so it is with us that if we are going to learn good judgment and discernment from the Lord, uh, we must humble ourselves. The psalmist was humbling himself, and he was relying on the Lord's commands for strength and direction in life. And the psalmist wants to do better in his faithfulness to the Lord. But again, to do that, he understood that he needed the Lord to help him do so. And so do we. If we are to do better in our Christian life, to draw closer unto the Lord, to have good judgment and knowledge that comes from heaven above, we need the Lord's help. Uh, he needed God to teach him good judgment and help him have the knowledge needed to see good success in his spiritual journey. And so do we. We see also in Philippians 1.9 that the Apostle Paul prayed for the church at Philippi in this manner. In Philippians 1.9, the Apostle wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with what? Knowledge and all discernment. So we need this heavenly knowledge. We need heavenly discernment. And we need God's help to reveal it to it, to open our spiritual eyes that we may see and understand and be able to be led by it and applied to our life. And so we always need the Lord to help us make good judgments and to have the knowledge needed to make sound decisions in this life. Because again, there is a common knowledge that is a gift from God unto man, a common uh, understanding of things, but this is something deeper. This is something more. 
that we need direction from the Lord as his children. Now, look at verse 67. He says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Now, this is a, a, a strong point. Sadly, it is often in times where things are going well when we stray from being dependent upon the Lord. So it's not always persecution that tests our faith, but also prosperity tests our faith. In other words, when things are going well, it's easy for us to look at things we've done, uh, to find a little bit too much uh, foundation in the things around us. We quit trusting in the Lord. We, keep, we quit seeking the Lord like we should. And so prosperity uh, can judge a person's faith and strip it bare as much as persecution. Afflictions actually can act as a fence sometimes that keeps us in the Lord's pasture to feed upon his care. But when all, everything's going well in life, sometimes we can stray and we get too comfortable in the flesh and too comfortable in being friends with the world, so to speak. And the psalmist here, he admits, he openly admits to going astray when things were well in his life. He says again in verse 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray. So he went astray when things were going well for him. And now afflictions had come and he was committed to keeping the Lord's word. And so we're not just to treat the Lord as a fire escape. We understand that. But bless God, we find him to be one when our house is caught fire. And I'm thankful for that, that he is that. Adversity causes us to pause, doesn't it? Adversity causes us, especially as Christians, to look unto God. And also, adversity can cause us to repent of our sins when we have strayed before adversity comes. And then experiencing restoration in our relationship with the Lord. God used the hurt from adversity to bring the psalmist back after he had gone astray. And now the psalmist was once again committed to the Lord's word. When adversity is used to do this in our lives, we must learn to bless God for difficult circumstances if they so return us to God and his word. They are a blessing, even though they are difficult. They are a blessing if they cause us to run into the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ, and especially when we have strayed before adversity have come. None of us enjoy when adversity strikes. We understand that. We don't enjoy that. We don't relish it, but they have a way of purging a child of God from sin that we do not experience in times of prosperity. Adversity can humble us. They do humble us, and they cause us to, to depend upon the Lord after we have strayed to depend only upon ourselves. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 18 and 19, uh, teaches this. I have heard Ephraim grieving. You have disciplined me, and I was disciplined like an untrained calf. Bring me back that I may be restored, for you are the Lord my God. For after I had turned away, I relented, and after I was instructed, I struck my thigh. I was ashamed and I was confounded because I bore the disgrace of my youth. And so, as Jeremiah proclaims in the youth, when prosperity, they'd run from the Lord. But now they are being disciplined like an untrained calf. And there they are being brought back in a covenant relationship with the Lord Almighty. And so the Lord can... And not only can he, but he does use the, dis the discipline of adversity to restore us when we have forgotten to trust in the Lord and when we have strayed from the Lord's guiding hand. It is good to connect this verse also with verse 71 of Psalm 119, where it says, It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Again, a powerful statement. It was good for me that I was afflicted. We know that we are maturing in our spiritual journey when we can thank God for adversity. Again, that takes faith because adversity can be painful. Difficulties are painful. Challenges are painful. But when we see them as a tool to bring us closer into the Lord and walking more in his ways and walking more in faith, we can learn to praise God for adversity and the discipline. And we see that it is good for us at points in our life 
to that we might walk in the way of the Lord. Now let's look at verse 68. He says, you are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Sounds like a simple, straightforward verse. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. This is a matter of faith. That even in persecution, God is good in every aspect of the word. And all of his divine attributes reveal his absolute goodness for us to enjoy. And we understand that no tongue can rightly tell just how good God is. But we have that little statement that we say sometimes, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Uh, that is something we learned as young people in church, or at least I did, and didn't think much about it when you're a kid, again, when you're being taken care of by good parents and you have all that you need and even a lot that you want. But the older you get and the more adversity you see, it takes a lot more faith to make that statement, doesn't it? God is good all the time, even in persecution, even during challenges, even in adversity, and all the time, God is good. It's a statement of faith that the psalmist was making. In Psalm 106, in verse 1, he says, Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And so the psalmist believes that the Lord is good, and the psalmist also believes, as we have seen, that he was right to discipline him, with the adversity that had come his way, so that he would be restored in his relationship with God. And so not only does he state that the Lord is good, but he also says that God does good. So not only is God good, but God does good, even when he allows difficulties in this life to sometimes discipline us when we have strayed. Again, the prayer returns, teach me your statutes. In other words, he needs to understand God's word. He needs to have the eyes of his heart and his soul open that he may see the word of God clearly and apply it to his life. He prays this so that he would also be good and do good through the teaching of God. And the psalmist was a learner and he loved to learn more about God and his word. We never get tired. The true Christian never gets tired of hearing God's word taught. They're not bored by that, as some people say. The Lord is good and will teach the ready learner his statutes. And I believe that. Too often we want an answer from the Lord about an issue in life without wanting to learn the Lord's ways and his words. Isn't that true? God, you give me an answer. But when it comes to really wanting to quiet our life and to quiet our heart and to learn more about God, uh, we don't want that as much. Not as many people want that. They want an answer. They want to know why this happened or why this didn't happen, why this hasn't gone away yet, whatever it might be. They don't really want to know the Lord more. And the answer comes in the more that we know the Lord and learn of his ways. This shows that we've not yet learned from discipline and adversity yet. When someone just wants the answer, but they don't want to know the one from whom the answer comes, it shows a lack of maturity in their life. When we just want a quick answer, but we do not want to know and understand the Lord better, then we've not rightly learned what God is trying to teach us. We must learn more of the Lord. Everybody wants a quick answer that makes sense to them. That doesn't happen in life, does it? Uh, even with God, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. Uh, even if he told us what he was doing, we, at times we wouldn't be able to understand or comprehend it, why he was doing what he's doing in certain uh, periods of history and life. But everybody wants a quick answer that makes sense, but fewer humble themselves. Fewer humble themselves and fewer trust in the Lord and fewer learn how God's statutes can make them better in this life. And that is sad. Verse 69 he goes back to his persecution. The insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. And so the proud and the insolent unbelievers, we've read of them already in this psalm. First, in verse 51, they ridiculed him. It says, the insolent utterly deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. 
And so first, they are ridiculing him. And now, these insolent, prideful people that are rejecting God and rejecting his servant and the psalmist, they now defrauded him by smearing his life with lies. It's not fun to be lied on, is it? That's a horrible thing. When someone says and they lie that you have done something that you didn't do or said something that you didn't say or they took something out of context and assumed that they knew who you were and, and your character by something they took out of context or took out of or heard from a lie from someone, that hurts. That hurts very badly. Enemies smear us with lies when they cannot find any damning truth about us to hurt us with. They'll come up with something. If there's nothing that they can catch us in, They'll come up with a reason. They'll make things up to wound us. And such was the case, as we know, with the prophet Daniel. His enemies could find no fault with him. So they came up with a scheme to hurt him in reference to his spiritual walk and love for the Lord and in his uh, daily prayers. And so as Job told his friends that accused him for suffering from wrongdoing, in Job chapter 13, verse 4, Job says, As for you, you whitewash with lies. Worthless physicians are you all. You don't know what you're talking about. You're smearing my life with lies. I've not sinned against the Lord. But they accused him of it. And they assumed that Job had done something wrong or else God wouldn't allow anything bad to happen in his life. So it had to be Job's fault, right? He says, worthless physicians are you all, he says to his friends. And so do not be too surprised when certain people smear your name with lies. Don't be too surprised. Do not turn away from the Lord and his word and with your whole heart seek to keep the Lord's word with the Holy Spirit's help. In his time and in his way, God will protect you. In his time and in his way, God will vindicate his people. In his time and in his way, God will keep you. Do you believe that tonight? Say amen. Verse 70. <clears throat> Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. Their heart is unfeeling like fat. Speaking again of the proud and insolent, that's who he's talking about here, is the proud and the insolent, the same ones that were ridiculing him, the same ones that were smearing his life with lies. That's who he's talking about here. And he is saying that their hearts are insensitive to God. They do not feel or care about what matters to God. That's why they lie. That's why they ridicule. That's why they're prideful. That's why they reject the worship of God. And unfortunately, these people are not only on the outside of the church judging us, but they are also sometimes within the church judging us. Now, they do not care what God is doing in another person's life or other people's lives. As a matter of fact, they, they really don't want to see anything good happen to other people. They're jealous. They care only about their ideas. They care only about their opinions. And they care only about their selfish needs in life. And that's why, as the scripture says, their heart is unfeeling like fat. This, this is disheartening and sad to see this. But we must continue, when this happens, to delight ourselves in God's word and stay focused upon what God is saying to us through God's Word. While others don't feel or care about what God is saying or doing, we must continue to seek Him. We must continue to learn from Him. We must continue to delight ourselves in His Word. And doing this will keep our spiritual heart healthy and happy, even while others ridicule, even if others lie against us and show themselves uncaring about the Lord and his word in his church. Delighting ourselves in the law of the Lord will help keep our hearts from growing cold and bitter and very brittle. In some scripture, verse 72, it says, The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. That's precious wording the psalmist used there. And again, we see how the psalms give us a voice, a language to speak. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. The last verse in this psalm, within a psalm, comes to us as wisdom literature in this psalm. And there are some other scriptures that go along with it. One is from Psalm 119, 127. Therefore I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. A child of God, do you love God's word above all the gold and silver and treasures of this world? 
That's a question that we need to be able to answer tonight honestly before the Lord. In Psalm 19.10, speaking of the wisdom, More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 14, speaking of wisdom, For the gain from her is better than gain from silver, and her profit is better than gold. Proverbs 8, 10 says, Take my instruction instead of silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. And then one last one in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 16, How much better to get wisdom than gold? To get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. Do you believe that tonight, child of God? Say amen. The psalm is saying that he values instruction from the Lord as better than he does great wealth. He values being a student of the word of the Lord above all the riches that the world craves and all the riches that the world searches for. Now, the same God who spoke the world into existence has spoken through his holy word and what we call the Holy Bible. That's what we've looked into tonight. Good judgment, sound knowledge from God and wisdom. What will we hold as more valuable than his revealed world, word? We've got to be able to answer that. What do I hold as more valuable than God's word that gives me good judgment and good understanding and good knowledge? And so let us also, whether we're in prosperity or whether we're in pain, let us remain eager students and faithful stewards of the mysteries of God. And so let us hold fast to the good news of Jesus Christ and the grace that brought it down to lost mankind. Many blessings are to be valued by us, but place no blessing above the one who blesses. Place no blessing above the one who blesses. We are always looking, not just for the blessing, but we are looking to know the blesser, the one who gives us all that we need in this life the one true living God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. And do not allow your life to be governed by anything greater than the Word of God. Why? Because nothing is more valuable. And all of his children said, Amen. To God be the glory tonight. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your Word and how it gives us wisdom. Again, O Holy Spirit, we ask that you would take what we've heard tonight and help us, O Lord, to apply it into our lives, whether we're in a time of prosperity or whether we're in a time of pain. Uh, make this time fruitful and beneficial in our life and draw us more closely to thee. Again, Lord, we are mindful of those in our midst and in our nation and in our world who are uh, in times of persecution. And we pray for your protective hand to be upon your children throughout the globe that are, might be in danger now even for being called a child of God, a Christian. Lord, be with them. God, we pray for our missionaries who also uh, many times put themselves in harm way and in discomfort for your good and for your glory. God, we pray that you would bless them in this very special way tonight and let them know that there are many Christians that love them, that care for them, and that are praying for them right now. Lord, again, as we begin to uh, depart from this place in a few moments, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would take us safely home and bring us safely back again this Lord's Day to worship thee. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for those of you on Facebook Live, thank you so much for spending some time in God's Word with us. Again, if at all possible, come be with us in-house Sunday morning. Sunday school at 10, and then uh, worship service at 11. We'll be having the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And then Sunday evening, we'll be in our fellowship hall uh, looking at a study being marked by Christ. The following week, we also start a new series. If you're not involved in Sunday school, that is a great time to get involved because there'll be a new series in Sunday school, a new series in the, in the pulpit going about the same thought. And so be praying for that and be uh, ready to come and join us if at all possible. If you absolutely cannot, uh, we do provide our Facebook Live worship service. And we also provide a Sunday school lesson taught by Brother Larry Gergen here at our church that you can benefit from from your home. 
Until we see you or hear from you again, thank you for joining us. May the Lord bless you. Bye-bye.